Welcome class, good to have everybody back tonight. I have two primary goals tonight. One is to introduce you to a new set of material that relates to what we said last night. And the second is this, what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight is some material that presented questions for me and a number of other folks that I know that we didn't know how to answer. I was presented this when I was giving lectures on the campus of the University of South Florida like these. And we had a question and answer period at the end of one of those lectures. And uh, a man stood up over here back on this side of the, audio, of the auditorium at the end of my session. And he stood up and said, now, Dr. Payne, you've done a really good job of explaining the amazing way that the cells build proteins and what we talked about last night. I know you remember everything that I said last night. And he said, uh, you did a good job of explaining the wonderful intricacies of that process. What you didn't do was tell the class tonight that only about 5% of the DNA is needed to do all of the proteins in the whole body. What about the other 95%? In other words, what you explained to the class was really only a small part of the DNA. So what about the rest of it? He said, there's appearance to us that the rest of that DNA is really some leftover junk from your evolutionary past. Well, I'm telling you tonight, I'm confessing my sins, that I didn't know how to answer that. I hadn't heard that before. This was in the late 1990s, early 2000s time frame. And it's hard to keep up with everything that's going on in studies as we learn more and more about these things. So here I was trying to answer, and as the expert up front, dealing with things, didn't have a good answer. So what do you do in that case? I'll tell you what I do. I say, well, sir, I appreciate you bringing that up. I am not familiar with that uh, argument and what you're talking about, but I will be going back and doing a lot of study, I can tell you that, to try to come up with what I know must be the truth. And I did, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. But I'm doing that for this reason. There will always be, in the sciences, things that you don't know how to answer. May I say that again? No matter what stage of life you're in, no what, matter what age of the uh, history of mankind, there will always be things you don't know how to answer. We can't know everything. And uh, they will sometimes challenge your faith because you don't know how to deal with it. What I have learned in my lifetime is if that happens to you and you are faith is being challenged and you're questioning your faith keep digging and keep learning and give it about 20 years <laughs> and in this case what I'm about to tell you about certainly over the next 15 to 20 years has unfolded in a marvelous way to give a powerful response from the natural world to that very challenging circumstance so that's why I want to talk about this to you tonight. I'm going to challenge you. But let's do a little quick review. So we're going to start. You see the title, the poor design argument, junk DNA. That's our subject for tonight. And the poor design argument comes from evolutionists who want to attack the idea of God by saying God would never do it this way. This is poorly designed. And if the DNA is 95% junk, wouldn't you say that's poorly designed? If that's the truth. God doesn't make things that are 95% junk. But that was the argument. So that's where we're headed. But let's start, as we have each night, with the scriptures. And I see something interesting happen to my slide here. I don't know what happened there, but the title is still the same. It's just not as big as it was before. 
Psalm 19 in the Old Testament says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The scriptures in this book, which I am convinced is the word of God, absolutely, solidly the word of God, based on a whole host of evidences of other kinds, this book says, nature testifies to the existence of God. Again, in Romans, the first chapter, which is really our theme passage for this week, says in verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the Bible says you can look at the natural world, you can examine carefully the things that you find there, and you will find evidence that there's a creator who made those things. So on the basis of that argument from design, we're going to turn our attention now to other evidences in the natural world from which we can draw the conclusion there had to be a designer to this. So thank you for being back tonight. Let's get right into the topic at hand. We showed you last night the cell, and we talked a little bit about how it's a self-replicating nanoscale robot. Now, I'm not going to teach that lesson all again, but you know that tied up in it is the DNA here inside the cell and a whole bunch of other things going on here at a rapid rate. I hope you remember from last night that I tried to show with the videos how rapidly these things happen amazing things happening down inside the cell to produce proteins in living things. And it is evident that every living cell is full of signs of intelligent design everywhere you look. Specifically, the DNA, which has a language in it that we've learned to read, decode, and we know what it's doing. Amazing things that we find in every single cell. I told you that Crick and Watson discovered the structure of DNA in 1953. Then we talked a little bit about that structure. It's a double helix with crossbars. It has four bases that are the cross pieces, and those bases constitute a language. And so if you'll notice right here, there are cross pieces across this. These are called nucleotides. And they make connection with each other every time it's an adenine with a thymine or a guanine with a cytosine. There are connections made here and there are literally millions of them in your DNA that make a strand of connections up and down that contain information. That's what Crick and Watson learned. And over time, we developed the genetic code and learned how to read that information. So over the next decade, scientists found out that DNA had a language in it, and they learned to decipher it and to understand it and what it was doing. That's last night's lesson, and I know you all remember that. The code, of course, for building proteins was found there as parts of every living cell. But as time went on, as we learned more about transcription migration and translation that builds proteins, things started to appear that were additional information we didn't get before. So let me blow this up a little bit and show you again what I showed you briefly last night. When the DNA unzips, by the way, class, what does it take to unzip DNA? Good, thank you. And in fact, it takes a whole glob of them, doesn't it? Yes. And those proteins themselves have to be coded in the DNA. So there's proteins involved in this process. The copy is made. This is called messenger RNA. So are some other RNAs over here, which we didn't talk about. But let's focus in on this one. Once the messenger RNA is copied from up here, what we began to learn in the 70s and the 80s of the 1900s was that that RNA didn't just take what was copied off the DNA and immediately use it. In fact, what we began to learn was that there are pieces of it called introns that are snipped out and reorganized to produce the mature messenger RNA. And so the question began to arise, why is that and how does that, what does that mean? And what do these introns here do, if anything? 
And the ideas that began to float out of that were, maybe those are things that really aren't necessary, they're just taken out and the part you really need is what's left here. And that other part really isn't useful, was part of what began to be thought as we learn more about the process. As the process for building proteins and other molecules became better understood from the 70s through the 90s, it was also discovered that parts of the DNA were not used for building proteins. That has become very clear to us since the 70s through the 90s. In fact, it became clear and that probably less than 5% of the DNA was needed for that process. Now that was beginning, beginning to be uncovered in the 1990s, about the time I was given those lectures, and then was challenged by this new fact that was coming to be known. So what about the rest of the DNA? The more we studied, the more we found out that the rest of that DNA had no part to play in the making of proteins. Folks, this amazing thing I just told you about yesterday, can be accomplished with about 5%. In fact, some people say it's down to 1% of the total DNA is needed for that. So what's the rest of it doing? Well, studies continued, and some began to describe the remaining stuff of that DNA as junk. And that's what I was challenged with. Would you believe in a God that makes something 95% junk? And then the Human Genome Project came along during this time period. It began in 1990, headed up by James Watson, by the way, and then later by Francis Collins, which you may have heard of in recent times as we've gone through this whole COVID thing. He's the head of the National Institute of Health. He headed up this program also. 1990 to 2003, over a period of 13 years, we mapped the entire human genome. Some 3 billion nucleotides in this DNA that's in every cell. That means 3 billion connections between those four bases I told you about. All has been mapped. And as that happened, we learned a whole lot more about the DNA. And coming out of that, I want to show you some quotations that came out of that from scientists. Ken Miller. Ken Miller is a biologist who publishes college biology textbooks. And in the book and in the magazine Technology Review in February of 1994, here's what he said. The human genome is littered with pseudogenes, gene fragments, orphaned genes, junk DNA, and so many repeated copies of pointless DNA sequences that it cannot be attributed to anything that resembles intelligent design. So what folks began to say, high-level scientists began to say, the DNA, which was being used by creationists to support a wonderful, amazing God, was really mostly junk. And Ken Brown is a widely respected scientist. He's also very hard-nosed about creationists. Doesn't think we should be around in biology. But you see what he said. In 2009, some years later, Richard Dawkins, the professor for the public education of science, from Oxford that I've referred to several times already, made this observation. It is a remarkable fact that the greater part, 95% in the case of humans, of the genome might as well not be there for all the difference it makes. Well, folks, I don't know how you feel about that, but that's disturbing to me. Because if that is a fact, then... How do you account for God in all this? I don't think he would build something that was 95% junk. Do you? Do something with your head. You don't think so, I hope. So how do you deal with this? That's the question. 
And that is what was being said over a period of about 15 or 20 years based on the Human Genome Project and other studies that were being done. It sure looked like there was a lot of junk. In fact, let me share with you another piece. And by the way, just to, so you know where I'm headed, I'm now going to be reading to you uh, from a little book called The Myth of Junk DNA. So you know I'm headed to a good place. But for a long time, it was not understood that it really is a myth. And people were saying pretty hard things. I think I have one more quote here. Let's see if I do. Yeah, here's our favorite author, Richard Dawkins. Pseudogenes are genes that once did something useful but have now been sidelined and are never transcribed or translated. What pseudogenes are useful for is embarrassing creationists. It stretches even their creative ingenuity to make up a convincing reason why an intelligent designer should have created a pseudogene unless he was deliberately setting out to fool us. This is typical Richard Dawkins. This is the argument class for poor design as it applies to DNA. And Dawkins would say to you, you believe in a God that would make 95% of it you don't even need? And uh, he said that in 2009, folks. I'm emphasizing that because the Human Genome Project finished in 2003 and a whole lot of information was being learned since then. And he's still saying it. I will tell you, I didn't know how to answer this. But I did say that night something that I think is the right thing to say. I said, well, I don't know how to answer your challenge right now. I would tell you that from the history of science, I would think we need to be real careful what we call junk in the sciences. Because there was a time in the 1800s when there was a German scientist who wrote a book about the human body and said it was a veritable bag of leftovers from our evolutionary past. That it was full of things that don't work anymore or that are not needed anymore. They called them vestigial organs. And he made a list of 150 things in the human body that he claimed were vestigial organs in the 1800s. Supporting the evolutionary theory that we're just a leftover of our evolutionary past. Maybe you know what some of those are. Can anybody give me an example of what they thought was a vestigial organ in your body? The appendix is the one we first think of. Say it again. The thyroid gland. The pineal gland. The gallbladder. The muscles in your outer ear. The bottom of your tailbone. That's left over from your evolutionary past, they say. And you don't really need it anymore. How about your tonsils and your adenoids? Now, I want to see hands in here. How many of you had your tonsils and adenoids taken out when you were a kid? Look around you, kids. Have you all had your tonsils and adenoids taken out? No. Raise your hands again. I want them to see. It's us old people. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you why I was in Holland my dad was a missionary in Holland from 49 to 54 I was four to nine years old I sat on a nurse's lap and they gassed me and took out my tonsils and adenoids I've never forgiven them <laughs> no but I had illnesses that they thought related to that and they thought the tonsils and adenoids were vestigial and you need to get them out of there because they are harmful to you those of you who had yours out was that the notion some of you that was a notion back then it's a very common among the medical profession get those out of there is that the case now doc I sleep apnea and then chronic uh, strep infection yeah but most of the time you're not taking those out because we've learned that tonsils and adenoids have important parts to play that we don't, didn't fully understand. In fact, of those 150 that this German scientist said were vestigial, I think there are three left that are even in that category at all. Because we've learned what they were for. So I'm glad you children still have your tonsils and adenoids.
And it's partly because science has changed his mind about that. So I did say that that night, and I said, please be careful what you call junk, because you may get embarrassed. And class, may I tell you, I hope when I get finished tonight, you will be embarrassed for them. Because it's not junk. So here came along, after the human genome project had completed and, and mapped the three billion nucleotides in your DNA. First, let me make another comment about that. How in the world could you have three billion nucleotides in your DNA? It's a little tiny cell down inside your body, inside the nucleus. I'll tell you how. It's all so wrapped up and tied up together into an amazingly condensed form so that all that information is wrapped up in almost no space which is part of the amazing part of DNA. But we've learned a whole lot more than that. And ENCODE, let's go back to that. ENCODE stands for, E-N-C comes from encyclopedia, OV, the O comes from that, DNA, the D here comes from that, elements. The encyclopedia of DNA elements, that's this examination that began to take place in 2003 right after the Human Genome Project finished. And let me read you now what was the purpose of this big study that was done. First, I'll give you some numbers here. <clears throat> it helped that I got myself together. The consortium that started this had over 30 universities and laboratories around the U.S. that, that included in this study. By the time they reached more uh, maturity, they had expanded to 440 scientists in 32 labs around the world that participated in ENCODE. It was a worldwide effort to do the following. The primary goal of ENCODE project is to determine the role of the remaining component of the genome, much of which was traditionally regarded as junk. These are not believers in God, folks. These are scientists all over the world. They want to find out what the rest of that genome is doing. And so they set about to do it. And I'm greatly appreciative of the massive amount of work that's been done over the last years. Secondly, it is to link variations in the expression of certain genes to the development of disease. So it was to help with the health professions. And to build a comprehensive parts list of functional elements in the human genome, including elements that act at, at the protein and RNA levels and the regulatory elements that control that and circumstances which is in the gene active, that is active. So they want to find out what is going on in the rest of that DNA there that's not being used for proteins. And that's what they set about to do. And as I said, hundreds of scientists involved in the project to try to come to a better understanding. So I'm about to show you the net results of ENCODE. And what I want you to remember is what Dawkins and Kenneth Brown said. Dawkins said, we might as well not even have the rest of this for all the good it is. Brown said it's just full of a bunch of junk pseudogenes and stuff you don't need. So now what have we learned from ENCODE? First, we've learned that over 80% of the human genome is actively involved in at least one or more biochemical reactions associated with gene regulation for each type of cell. So what I'm going to read you now is the results from the ENCODE study. The vast majority of the human genome participates in at least one biochemical RNA or chromatin-associated event in at least one cell type. So what they thought was 95% junk, 80% of it is absolutely certainly involved in some kind of biochemical process in your body. Much of the genome lies close to a regulating event. 95% lies within 8 kilobytes of a DNA protein interaction and 99% within 1.7 kilobytes of at least one biochemical event measured by, coda, by ENCODE. 
class, their first conclusion from 12 years of study was almost all of the DNA is involved in some method that is involved with your cell's activity. Unlike 95% of it is junk. The human genome may contain only about 21,000 genes, and I pause there a moment to tell you, and we don't have time to go into this tonight, but even the word gene class is coming into question as to what it means because the gene is much more complicated than we ever dreamed. A gene is supposed to be a part of your DNA genome, and it's supposed to be activated for certain particular things. What we're learning is genes interact with one another, and there's a whole lot of overlap and play going on in there among the whole system. So what is a gene anymore? And I'll just tell you, if you want to investigate this, you can find subjects today being discussed as what's the definition of a gene because it's become so complex and involved. So if the body has 21,000 genes in our cells, the ENCODE scientists found 70,290 areas, 92 areas called gene promoters that precede the protein coding areas of the genes. So there's areas that code for proteins, but there's a whole bunch of areas that are promoters that help that happen that we knew nothing about before. 70,292 of them that we've already discovered. In addition to that, the gene expression is controlled by a broad array of regulatory proteins, chemical marks in the DNA, gene promoter features, Enhancer sequencers sometimes located millions of bases from a gene or set of genes. Class, I think I can say it to you this way, probably most simply. What we're learning is all the rest of that DNA is like a massive operating system that helps it all function properly and that puts it in time-wise and chem uh, chemically-wise when it's supposed to be, that promotes the action or retards it. Lots of activity going on in your cells we knew nothing about till this started. So here's a picture. Everybody's eyes up here. I'm going to try to explain to you some pieces of this. These are things we've learned just since that ENCODE project started. If you think of this as a strand of DNA, here are the genes. And you can see in them are exons and introns. These little whitish areas are introns, and the exons are what actually code for proteins. Every one of those introns we have come to learn are themselves copied, and they make more RNAs. They are little tiny RNAs that are used for all kinds of things in your body that we didn't know about before. So even this piece of it that we knew a lot about has become more evident as to what's happening. But right in front, you see right here in this red area, there are promoter-like elements in the DNA that help this process take place when the transcripts are actually made. These promoters that I told you we've discovered 70,000 of them in your DNA are additional promoters to make this process happen. And way down the line here are called enhancers. These guys also take place. They help to control what's happening in this huge system from a great distance. These are sometimes a million codes, codons away from up this, here at this gene. So look over here with me. Here is the 3D chromatin structure. And here's how it's all wrapped up. Can you see how that tightly that is wrapped up? And when you blow that up a little bit, you find out that this is all made up of a bunch of connected balls where the thing is wrapped around it and organized. And so you have chromatin interactions, you have chromatin modifications. All of these are taking place inside this packed, dense area of DNA. And here's the RNA polymerase we talked about yesterday, riding along the DNA strand and making copies to make a protein. But all of this other has been discovered since then. And a whole lot of that is just beyond my uh, time and ability to explain to you tonight. But it's massive what we've learned. That's what's going on. What about pseudogenes? 
Remember what Dawkins said about that? A pseudogene is really made by God to fool us. That's how he said it. Because a pseudogene is supposed to be something that worked for a while, but now it doesn't. And you find pseudogenes in the DNA of lots of creatures, including humans. So we're not going to argue with what's the truth there. But what about pseudogenes? Here's what we've learned. Some have produced functional proteins. Some have produced RNAs that suppress the expression of their corresponding functional genes. Some have produced RNAs that increase the expression of their corresponding functional genes. In other words, the pseudogenes that we thought did nothing, we're finding out do all kinds of things. And what they do is very useful to your body. So to make the argument that they're useless and God just put them there to fool you, it just isn't holding up anymore. Pseudogenes have functions. Now back to this. You remember I told you about these introns here that are snipped out? I want to talk about some detail about how that works. There's a whole lot that goes on right here to make that happen. In the first place, tell me what all you have to have several of. Protein. Proteins. Specific kinds of proteins to make that happen. They are called spliceosomes and editosomes because you've got to splice them out of there and then edit this back together. And what we've learned is when you splice these out, they have a function. Let me go to the next slide and we'll come back to this one. Introns themselves, those little pieces that were spliced out, are rich in splicing factor recognition sites. They encode a majority of the small RNAs, and the RNAs from introns influence gene expression by modifying chromatin. And the little RNAs that are produced from those introns do all kinds of activity in your body constantly. So they're being copied and used for productive purposes. Let me go back to this. So what people thought in the beginning when those were snipped out, they thought they were just thrown away and useless, not used at all. What we've learned is there's a whole lot of use for those introns, and they continue to be. And here's another thing you need to recognize. This piece of copied information off the DNA takes up a little piece of the DNA, and there it is. That one piece of DNA that's been copied, after it's edited, forms a particular mature messenger RNA that produces a protein. Everybody's eyes up here. What if, when you snipped out these three, you organized them so that this came first, that second, that third and that fourth when you completed it down here. You turned it around in a different order. You'd have a different protein class from the same piece of information on the DNA. What if you did this one first, that one second, that one third, and that one fourth when you put it all back together? That's a different protein. And you, I could keep going, couldn't I? And that, by the way, there can be different sizes of introns in here. So what we've learned over time is this one piece of messenger RNA copied from up here could make as many as a thousand different proteins from that one piece. By the way, it's snipped and reordered in the process. Again, we didn't know any of that 20 years ago. But what we found out is the information packed in the DNA is a whole lot more compacted with all kinds of information in there than we ever knew before. So this piece of introns here is an amazing study in and of itself. And more and more information is being learned about how the DNA, even in the pieces that is coded for proteins, is much more complex than we thought. The, con the information is so densely concentrated and specified information in DNA because there are multiple messages stored in the same sequence of bases that I just described to you. Spliceosomes and editosomes are, what do you think? Yes, that's good. Let me ask that again. Spliceosomes and editosomes are what? Proteins. proteins. And they are massive proteins that do all kinds of amazing things. I'm going to show you a spliceosome right now and try to get this across to you. <clears throat> if you want to study something fascinating, you go to these animations and look at spliceosomes activated. 
So look up here at the top. Here is a typical spliceosome. <clears throat> here's the exon, here's the intron, and here's the other exon. This is the piece you're going to snip out. So how do you do that? You need to splice it. So the splicing itself consists of several RNPs assembled to form the spliceosome. So here's one, two, three, four different SNRNPs that are used to assemble this spliceosome that comes together in this glob. Does that remind you the glob of protein sitting on the DNA, riding along and reading it before? It's the same kind of idea. But it's extremely complicated, folks. This m combination of features here is not just proteins. It also has RNA in it and some other features. So it combines together here, and notice what it does. It takes the intron, it splices it here, takes it loose, and then it connects it together here into a loop, and then it splices it here, and at the same time, these two exons are brought together and connected. And so here's the excised intron, here's the renewed uh, messenger RNA, the three and five ends of the exons bond covalently, release the intron, and you've now made the splice take place. If I were to describe to you the chemistry of that process, it would take me the next 30 minutes just to read it all. That's what's happening there. And it's proteins making this thing splice to give you much more opportunities than you had before. So the spliceosome itself is extremely complex, and so are the editosomes that put it back together. But here's the piece that to me just absolutely blows my mind. Do you know the word steganography? Steganography. It's a form of cryptography. <clears throat> uh, let me have you say that word. Steganography. steganography. It's a form of cryptob cryptography. Yeah, say that too. Cryptography. Good. It's the simultaneous communication of two written messages, one embedded in the other. It is similar to that of providing a template for an amino acid sequence together with non-coding information in the nucleotide sequence. I lost you. But there's a message inside a message in DNA. And the example that this author uses to illustrate it is a woman in the Revolutionary War whose husband was off to war. He was in the South. I mean, he lived in the South, so he fought for the rebels, and he was off to battle. His wife was home with the kids, taking care of things. She wrote him a letter, and they had agreed on this process, telling him about the kids, the farm animals, how life was going, school, and a bunch of other mundane things about their family. But if you knew the code, how to read within that letter, which was a normal letter about normal things, you could find out where the nearest repository is was for all of their artillery, where the troop movements were taking place, and where you ought to be next if you want to be ready for them. That's called steganography, where you have a code inside a language or a code that communicates something different than what the language communicates. Now I ask you, class, is there anybody with reasonable sense that would think that nature by itself, acting natural selection, acting on natural variation, could produce a code within a code that we've learned how to read them both? That's not going to happen, folks. But it's happening in your DNA a lot. That's another thing that's come out of this. There are codes within codes, dual and overlapping messages, in addition just to the things that we've talked about in building proteins. So, codes within codes is a powerful evidence that somebody designed this system. And 80, everywhere you look, it's the whole system, not just the 5% used for protein building. It's everywhere. And it's well established. 
So what I'm telling you tonight is the more we learn about the supposed junk DNA, the more it appears to be designed everywhere you look. And so I want to close by reading you just a little bit from So where do we go from here? Scientists make progress by testing hypotheses against the evidence. But when scientists ignore the evidence and cling to a hypothesis for philosophical and theological reasons, the hypothesis becomes a myth. Junk DNA is such a myth, and it's time to leave it behind, along with all the other discarded myths from the past. The fact is, junk DNA should never have been called that in the first place. It's a scientific myth that has been perpetrated on people and it's supposed to be coming from the highest level of folks who are telling us who are uninformed what science is telling us. And they've misstated. And the more information we gather, the stronger the case gets that junk DNA is a myth. And so to finish my lecture tonight, I want to reference you a couple of other books. Michael Behe has written a book called Darwin's Black Box, which I've referenced already. Powerfully important book, and if you haven't studied this material very much yet, start with this book. Published first in 1996. Get the second edition from 2006. This talks about how Darwin didn't know a lot of these things, so he can almost be excused. But what we know now at the chemical level, there's no way this happened without a designer. Now he's written a book called Darwin Devolves. I'm developing a new lecture about this. So you're getting a little preview. In this book, he argues that not only does natural selection acting on natural variation not, not account for all the things we see, it in fact is limiting what can happen. Darwin devolves because his own method, natural selection acting on natural variation, limits how much change you can make. Because it forces upon matter to stop when you've produced something better, even if it breaks it. Darwin Devolves is a powerful book you need to read because it shows that Darwin's theory, which I'm firmly convinced is right on a limited basis, proves now because we have massive things to work with in terms of the number of objects we can look at like bacteria and the time we have to study it over periods of time and lots of people and lots of labs what we've demonstrated is <clears throat> Darwinism devolves rather than evolves and it's amazing what we've learned <clears throat> so Everywhere we look, from the macroscopic to the microscopic, things look like they're made. You see a piercing cry of design everywhere. In this subject of junk DNA, just as powerfully as in any of the other subjects we've discussed. And uh, I made it a purpose tonight to make up for myself for last night. So I'm going to stop right there and see if there are any questions that anybody has tonight. Because I really wore you out last night. And I don't want to do that again. So we'll take either written, you have some duck there? Okay, go ahead, let's just take an oral question. I was just curious on all these processes you've described over the past couple of nights, is there waste that's involved in these processes? And if so, what happens to that waste? Yeah, if you didn't hear, he said, is there waste involved? One of the things, I'll just answer in general, one of the things with living systems is in our cells in particular. There are methods built in to recycle waste. You remember last night I showed you the, about the building of the flagellum? When that little cap that drills through the cell wall is released, it goes back into the cytoplasm and it's recycled and used again. The transfer RNA that brings those amino acids in to be added to build a protein goes back into the cell and is recycled. There are numerous other examples of that where something is used for a process and then it goes back and is recycled and uh, used again. So there's a lot of that going on. 
in lots of places in the cell. In general, that's the case. Yes, sir. Okay, well, I'll tell you one. <clears throat> Folks like Richard Dawkins have quit talking about junk DNA very much because they've seen that's a hopeless case anymore because we're showing powerful use for this. Do we know everything about it? Not by any stretch. There's a whole lot more to be learned. Are they changing their basic view of the evolutionary viewpoint? Absolutely not. No, they're still proposing that all of this can be explained by natural causes. So no, that's not happening. Now there are some, I've shown you a couple, haven't I? Who have decided this information is so powerful, I have to give it up. Somebody designed this. So I think men who are honest and straightforward and willing to consider something that isn't the standard world view can be convinced and have been. Yes, ma'am. How, how do evolutionists account for backup systems that the Lord built into our bodies? For instance, the first creature who would need a backup breathing system when your nose got clogged would just die. And then the next time your nose got clogged, if you didn't have a backup system, you would just die. So how do, how do they account for it? We have multiple backup systems. For yes, we do. Them. We do have a lot of them. It is difficult. I don't have a good answer for that because I don't think they do either. Uh, I mean, they'd have to come up with something like it's evolved, co-evolved uh, along with the other. And that makes it even more complicated, doesn't it? To me, it's like a code inside a code. How do you get a code inside of a code to evolve? That's problematic. So yes, there are things like that can be multiplied that are hard to answer from an evolutionary standpoint. If you find something on that, send it to me. Because I don't have a good answer for that one. Somebody else had a hand up. Yes, sir. Based on the previous question, if they were to admit that there's a possibility that there was a design, that actually doesn't change the science, it just changes everything about their belief system. Correct. I think that's right. Y'all hear that? I think if they were to admit that there's a designer, a supernatural designer, it does change their whole worldview. And they're not going there. If I have a quote from Lewinton. In, at Harvard that basically says we have an a priori commitment to materialism. And he just says it. And he says because of that we maintain a response no matter how ridiculous it may seem. He doesn't use the word ridiculous but he said just so stories. That's better than admitting there's a God. And at the end of that quote he says we cannot allow God's foot in the door, period. So they have an a priori commitment to materialism, which means nature's all there is, and we can't allow it otherwise. Well, look, I could win a debate if you can take away the only other answer, which is exactly what's happened. Because I'm not allowed to teach what I'm teaching you in this class tonight, in the public school system because it's considered religion. And I think I can teach this from science, don't you? I think so. We don't have to use a religious book or a religious notion. And by the way, please don't misunderstand me about the two books. <laughs> I don't want folks feeling badly about that. The book of nature, I'm convinced, is another way God testifies to himself. It's not these books that I'm quoting from I'm talking about. It's nature itself that testifies to the existence of God. That's his other book. And it's powerful, more than it's ever been in the history of mankind, seems to me. All right, did you have any back there? Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know how this is related, but why do you think the two sides exist? What is the idea behind it? I mean, because for whatever we see right now, I mean, everything is going against our belief. 
Yeah, I'm not sure what you're asking, so help me understand it. Can you help me? What's, what's he trying to say? Why are so many people still, I think, hanging on to this idea of evolution? Why are the two sides we have all this evidence with respect yeah. to creation and that there's a designer? Well, I wish I could take you with me to some of my science classes back years ago and listen to those professors. I have, I'm not sure I have met more closed-minded people who are hardline evolutionists. Because as I just quoted from Lewinton, a Harvard professor, we have an a priori commitment to materialism. That means before you ever start, we've decided the only explanation we'll accept is material. So you can't have a God. We're not going there. And you know why he thinks that? Because if you add in God, you've started a belief system that's religious and philosophical, not science. We're not having it. If you followed the Ohio case some years ago where we tried to introduce, some people did, the teaching of creation in public schools. Y'all remember that case in Ohio, went before the judge? And some of the folks I've been quoting to you went and testified before that uh, judge. The decision was made, no, creation is an interesting philosophical view, but it's not science, and we will not have it in the schools. And I'm saying to you folks, the evolutionary theory, the general theory of evolution, is also philosophy when you get to the base. And it's based on belief. Sure, there's some evidence can be interpreted that way, but ultimately it's a belief just like yours and mine who believe in God. So there are answers to that from their standpoint because it's, the door's closed. Doesn't matter how strong the evidence is, we're not going there. That's the truth. Good, I'm glad we're having some time for, for questions tonight. This long-winded speaker didn't take the whole time. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. Teaches very clearly. Jesus, the apostles, the Old Testament. He that hath ears to hear, let them hear. Yes, sir. If a person does not want to hear, they will not accept God or the things of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it, it is dealing with an atheist or whoever. Uh, if he is an honest person, he will admit there's some issues. But if he's not honest, the door's closed, like you said. Correct. Well, and may I say this? Have you ever dealt with a Christian who's closed minded? <laughs> I have, in some areas. You know, they get so set on what they think they know from Scripture, and maybe they're wrong. But they're not wrong. So that can happen anywhere. But I will tell you, my experience has been some of the scientists in this realm, especially, are very closed minded. And that's why. What I've told you is why. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, would you have any advice for dealing with individuals like that where you know they're starting from the closed door perspective, so to speak, and cracking that door open at all? <laughs> How to talk to people like that? Yeah. Well, the closest thing I've been is I've talked to some younger people who were inundated with this as youngsters and the whole world view that really has consumed their life about the same kinds of evidence I've been telling to you. But I haven't had any success with the guys that were teaching me these things. So the only thing I would know is quoting the Bible to them isn't going to do it. Because they don't even believe God exists. So it's kind of not helpful to quote the Bible. I like to start on their field and use what they did. Can I make a comment here? Did any of you get to see the debate between Ken Ham and Bill Nye, the science guy? Any of you see that? Okay, I don't know how you felt about it, but I'm going to tell you my opinion about that. Ken Ham takes the approach that the Bible's the Word of God, which I also do, and then he says from there, 
the science agrees with the Bible, which is fine. That's a great argument to make. But if you're going to be debating somebody who doesn't believe in God, that's a difficult place to start. So those guys in that debate were like this. They were in two different universes. And the debate accomplished very little, I think, in terms of changing anybody's minds, because they were on a different playing field completely. In my judgment, the better way to do it, whether you win it or not, is to start with the science, because both of us would agree that science is a good place to get information, and let the science speak. And then if you can convince someone from the science that the natural world says, as Behe says, there's design everywhere you look, then let's talk about who that designer is. Okay? And another illustration. The SETI program I love to use as an example. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Have you been following our Congress's investigation into UFOs in the last two years? When I was at Harvard, I took astronomy from a world-famous radio astronomer, and one of my assignments was to do a special paper on UFOs. So I did an investigation at that time, that was in 67, 68. What's all we know about UFOs? And you surely have heard the stories about how little green men from somewhere have landed here, and we've seen them, and we've actually captured some of them, and some of them are being kept somewhere in a... Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Are you an expert on this? No. <laughs> They're not green. Yeah, let's... Let's be careful. My point is there are a lot of stories about that going on and you can listen at late night talk shows and it's overrun with this stuff. And it's back. Now they're calling it unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAPs, instead of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. So they made it a little broader. But there's a committee established, and in fact, there's a subgroup of the Department of Defense that now is taking in all those reports and examining back what's going on with this. And I can tell you, these young people heard it Sunday morning. I read you the final results, right, because I don't have my paper with me tonight. So I want them to testify. When I told you about the results of all their studies, what have they found about little green men or anything else like that that's come our way and landed on earth? Zero! <laughs> I mean, there's a report that came out February of this year summarizing all the studies they've done the last two years is there is no evidence of significance of any kind to support we've been visited by extraterrestrials. So why are they still looking for them? It's because they believe there are other civilizations somewhere out there in outer space based on, as SETI says on their website, what we know about the origin of life now on Earth suggests that it could happen other places. Folks, what it suggests is there is no way it's happening anywhere else and we have no clue about how it happened here without a designer. But if you believe that, you're going to be looking. But here's the thing. What are they looking for? Signs of intelligence. <laughs> Is that interesting? That's my argument. So I agree that SETI is using good science to investigate a question of are there intelligent beings out there in the universe? How would you know that? I'll tell you how. If you get a narrow band radio signal containing a language or the prime numbers or some other specified information, that is powerful evidence somebody out there intelligence did that. Because nobody believes the stars blinked out the first 25 prime numbers in a row. <coughs> That's what they're doing. And my answer is, why don't you use the same reasoning on every cell in your body right here on earth 
in every cell in your nose, <laughs> right under your nose and in your nose. Because they all are shouting design right here. You don't have to look out there. But no, what we say here is, even though there's a language in every cell in your body that we know how to decode and read, isn't it interesting how nature did that by itself? I'm sorry, it's the same kind of reasoning. But we won't apply it here on earth. Okay, I don't know how I got off on all that. Did somebody ask a question about that? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Each one of those finely tuned factors is a statistical anomaly on its own. Yes. But how many of these factors before the math becomes impossible? Well, not very many, frankly. By the way, <laughs> since you opened the door. <laughs> in this book, Darwin devolves. He, he shows you that just to get two mutations that would contribute to one of these more complex chemicals is so astronomically improbable that it just doesn't happen. But it would take a thousand mutations to produce a lot of the things that we think we have produced that way. When we know very well it can't possibly happen. So it doesn't take that many before the numbers add up unbelievably. I'm going to mention a third book by Behe. It's called The Edge of Evolution. And what he says is, it's possible now, with all we have at our disposal, to do experiments on millions of bacteria and watch their generations, because they reproduce a lot, and watch what happens to evolution. In fact, there's been an experiment done up at Michigan State over years of time with bacteria, just watching what they do. And they use, by the way, E. coli. And what they've learned over time is you do get mutations, and they produce changes in these little guys, and some of them help them survive longer, right? Don't you know that there are bacteria that are no longer uh, killed by penicillin? Are you aware of this? How did that happen? They mutated, and the mutants no longer killed by penicillin. Is that good for the bacteria? Why, yeah. That's profitable. Is it good for us? Uh -uh. We've got to find another medicine. And we do. We go looking for it. The class. What you find out over time when you look at those mutants after mutants after mutants after mutants, what have you got when you got finished? Messed up bacteria. And here's something else we've discovered. Even mutations that are helpful to the bacteria have cost them information. In other words, something broke, but it helped them survive. And the example be he uses like if you're at war and the army's coming in on you and you've got to save yourself, you may just burn up the whole bridge and tear up a lot of things to keep you alive. And in genetically, if something needs to break in order for you to defend yourself against penicillin, and there's a specific reason penicillin doesn't work on some of those bacteria is because one place on them where the penicillin would sit and kill them is now a different shape. But it's because something broke. You listening? You don't build things by breaking stuff where you grow something more complex. But it appears now, the evidence is overwhelming, that all mutations decrease the information content in the DNA. Don't believe me. Go study it for yourself. That's what I'm being told. And if that's the case, Darwin's method falls to the ground. Limited change can produce limited change. But not all the living things you see. Yes, sir. Is that similar then to the where it's, it's expanding outwards, only just the, only this one would be the genome contracting, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, because in terms of its total information content, it's being reduced. 
That's correct. In other words, you have this complex creature already. Where did it come from? Well, supposedly it got built up from less and less complex things over time. That's not what the evidence is showing. That's exactly right. All right, well, it's 8.08, and I'm not keeping you long tonight. So we'll not do any other questions right now, and you guys have something you want to do next. So thank you, class. You were a good class tonight. You were a little weary tonight. I could tell that. But it's my fault, so... <laughs> It's okay.